So welcome everyone and thank you for joining us. So we'll, we'll, we'll start right off um, and kick off this conversation with just um, definitions, for example. So from your experiences, from your time working in special needs, from your time working in education, and from what you know about the research concerning special education needs, what would you say special needs is? Um, um, Unoma, do you want to start us off with that? Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? I hope you can. Yes. Okay. So well, the United Nations defines special educational needs as any additional requirements to the regular curriculum to enable a student to learn. So if a student needs anything that is not in the norm of the general school practice, that child has a special requirement and a special need that your school you know, on, he's, has the right to provide for them, to give them a fair chance to access the curriculum at the same level as their peers, despite their learning challenges. So that, that is um, what I'll say special need is. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you for, for that breadth of definition. Um, does any other pan member of the panel want to um, jump in and add to that definition? Yes. Um, thank you, Unoma. I think I pronounced it correctly. <laughs> so yes, um, special needs, like she said, um, any child that requires any additional help definitely has a special need. And special needs actually, um, at least um, it's like, it's divided into four. That's the most popular um, um, poem, four parts that um, SEN has been divided into. So we have the cognition and the learning difficulties. We have the social, emotional, or mental um, needs. We have the communication and interaction needs. And we have sensory and physical needs. So um, this means that there are so many types of special needs. Although like um, in my experience, I've noticed that once someone wants to talk about special needs, they just automatically say autism. Or when they feel like a child needs special needs, just maybe they just name the child. Oh, you have Down syndrome, you have autism. Some of them don't even know what it is, um, how it works. They just once they feel like a child, since special needs uh, started gaining awareness, once they feel like a child needs, they just name it something. But actually, it's divided into four, and under those four categories, um we have different types of special needs under those four categories and they actually manifest in different ways even the ones that feel like oh they are the same under the same need maybe the child is autistic and autistic um, autism is in spectrum no two children would manifest autism in the same way so it's it's different there, there are different types of needs and those different types of needs actually need different types of intervention so, but the popular ones, I'll start with the cognition and learning difficulties. We have the specific learning difficulties. That's where we have the dyslexia, um, 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 difficulties with reading and um, writing and coding. We have dyscalculia, which has to do with numbers. We have dysgraphia, which has to do with handwriting, la uh, lack of core motor skills. We have, this, um, I think, the dysgraphia and... Um, there's one that has to do with coordination, dyspraxia. Yes, dyspraxia. And we have the moderate learning difficulties, severe learning difficulties, profound and multiple learning difficulties. All them ones are when a child has specific learning difficulties like the dyslexia and the rest, or the child between the moderate and profound uh, multiple learning, uh, learning difficulties, the child just finds it extremely difficult to learn at the same pace his age mates are learning. So um, even with the, um, the teacher to differentiation, the, the child will still struggle. Even if you're differentiating for the child, the child will still struggle. And on that social emotional, that's where we have the ADHD. I think that's the most popular one that we know. On that communications and interaction, that's where we have the autism spectrum. And on that sensory, we have the visual impairment, hearing impairment, just like the name says, they're just impairments when it comes to hearing and um, seeing. So we have different types of needs. And before 
one can say, okay, a child has special needs. Every, the teacher must have done everything necessary and possible for that child to learn, and the child is still struggling. Then you can be able to, okay, let's move this child to the special needs department. Maybe they should do an assessment to know if this child has or needs extra facilities to help the child learn. But the teacher, like I said, the teacher must have tried everything. And the teacher has to be observant to observe some certain things you feel might be maybe um, maybe um, forming a type of difficulty for the child to learn. And also, second language, if English is not your first language, that's not a learning difficulty. Sometimes you might have some children in your class that probably grew up in the East or in another country and English was not their first language. They'll struggle, obviously, but it doesn't mean that they have special needs. You know, that's why I said the teacher has to be very observant. You need to, and you need to come up with different methods before you can say, okay, this child might have special needs. And the child has to be assessed by an educational psychologist or a special needs um, certified teacher and um, trainer. And it has to come up with a form of assessment. Okay, this is what this child is suffering from. If that has not been done, that child does not, cannot like officially be said that this child has special needs and needs special requirements. So an assessment has to be done. And teachers are not, no matter, even if you know the symptoms, those are for you to observe, to speak to someone about it, your head teacher or your special educational needs coordinator, but not for you to tag a child or to just say, oh, this child has ADHD, this child has autism, this child has this or that. It's just for you to be observant, to know what you should look out for, to know if this child needs extra help. Thank you. I just want to add to what um, Princess Otiba has said. Um, it's not just about it's not just in school; it's also what happens at home. So whatever the teacher is seeing in school should be corroborated with parents at home, because you have some parents that say, "Oh, but at home they don't do this." They don't do that. So it's it's a very it's um, very tricky sometimes because usually you may have parents say, "You know, no, at home this child is like a little genius. It's probably your school that's got issues." So usually these things are exhibited at home and in school. In a situation where you say it's only in school, maybe at home for real, the child learns, the child does what they have to do. It's me, as she's saying, it has, and it has not been that, it may not be a special maybe just behavior challenges, something happening in school or something like that. So it's a very, it's something that I have to really look into carefully and it's very sensitive and the parents have to be very involved when you're banding around the term that their child may have, may require additional needs in the classroom, yeah something more uh, to under the umbrella of special needs and that is uh, those children who are gifted and talented they also come under the umbrella of special needs they may not uh, may need more because if they are not challenged sufficiently in the classroom they may display behavioral issues and stuff like that so under the umbrella of special needs yes we have those who have uh, needs and extra support, uh, the, those who have English as a second language, and those who are gifted. Thank you. 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 Other language difficulties are in that category, but thank you, um, Unoma and Emanuela, for setting us up really nicely. Before we make any more progress, I know this has come to the surface over and over again, where people are wondering, how do I address students that are found in this situation? Do I address them as students with special needs or do I address them as special needs students? So let's do a little clarification before we make any progress. They, uh, I don't think we should label anybody. Uh, it's better to call them children who have needs because uh, that can lead to bullying, you know, and low self-esteem. So uh, it wouldn't be a good idea uh, to label them because everybody's needs are different. and uh, It's between the child, the teacher, the parents. So we can't generalize uh, all the children by giving them one label. Yeah, but I want okay, to. I, so, um, I, I can. I would like to add that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I agree with um, Manjusha with about the link. Yeah, oh, no, no, no. Okay, sorry. Um, sorry, go on. 
Okay, I agree with um, Manjusha when it comes to the labeling. Yes, um, it's not um, appropriate to label a child or to tag the child because it just means that it's like it's prejudice. People might, um, or teachers might prejudge the child even before they even handle the child or find out the child for themselves. But at the same time, it's like um, Norma said at the beginning, it's a very sensitive issue. At the same time, a kind of awareness needs to be there. Because that's how inclusion can happen. If people don't know what you have or, or, or where you might need help, they might not be able to actually help appropriately. So for instance, um, like in, in the case of bullying, obviously you can do a bit of awareness for your kids and explain um, some certain situations. And you know, obviously as teachers, we know how to do that. We know how to pass the message across to our, our children. Children are more empathetic than we think when they understand or when they, or when they know. And obviously it extends to other teachers, it extends to even the security guards, the cleaners, because that's the only way inclusion can actually take place. But it's not a thing of gossip or a thing of um, being condescending. It's more like enlightening people on a particular um, um, difficulty or disability about a student so that they would also understand why that student needs extra help. And um, also, like I said, inclusion will take place. For instance, a child that probably has some dis um, physical disability, if, um, the, um, for instance, we have the external teachers that just come like PE or maybe music, and it might require the, uh, the students to dance. If the teacher is not aware that this child might, because some of them don't physically show it, it might just be a need that obviously as teachers we know or as school um, management we know. So for instance, oh, we can inform, okay, this student has this, this, this. The reason I'm giving this information is so that you can be kept with the kind of activities you give the child and please and you have to educate them properly he's like, oh go and sit down and uh, you don't know what to, you cannot be able to do it no 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 no. you even have to ask the student do you think you can do this and that is you acting based on the knowledge you have received that okay this child might require extra help so it's tricky but i still feel the awareness should be there so that it can also um, bring about the need or the help the child needs So uh, yeah, to add to that, from my experience, as she said, when I was a class teacher and I had, you know, multiple abilities to that. Basically, my classrooms are like, we, we are like a family. And I always tell them, like, you know, everybody is different. We all have our needs. We all have our, you know, the things that trigger, the things we like, the things that, um, sorry, the things that, um, you know, make us upset, the things that help motivate us and stuff like that. So basically, I think, as she said, it's letting the, their peers know that, you know, everyone is different. And when I say everyone is different, I do I say to them, like, not just these children with extra needs, even you, the typically developing child, you know, there are some things. And then we have, like, a discussion, like, oh, what, what, what do you like? What don't you like? And stuff like that. I've seen that it works very well in making my class. I like my children in my class. Like, I, I'm like, we all we have to I care like my for my class. Like, I have to look out for each other. So when you put it from them in that perspective, you find that they are more willing to help and not as condescending as she said because sometimes it could lead to like um children can be really mean but it depends on how the class teacher puts mm. it and then sometimes you hear them even educating the other people to like hey don't do this to this person because you know he has this challenge here and like so i think it's the teachers and it, it should be like a school project because the schools i've taught in there are like very family like very everybody knows everybody everybody so it, but it has to start the children have to be aware that this person may need more help than you if the teacher seems to be giving them more attention it's not it's just that they may struggle a little bit more than you and you may also struggle in some other things as well because even our typically developing children they do have incidences where they where they are struggling and they feel left out by the teacher because they're like me they are always with that child because he's like this but you don't come to me because i'm like that so it, it, it's a very um slippery slope of um you know emotions behaviors from the teacher's part from the student's part so teachers need to be aware also like i said it's not just the child with special needs in your class of all the children in your class so that they don't feel you give more attention to them than the others then something manjusha said we usually overlook the gifted children we're like yeah they're okay they are good they are flying and then you find that no they need to also be extended or that's where your behavior issues increase that is where your yeah. bullying issues increase that so those are the areas that yeah i think we also overlook in special needs a lot but they are part of it and well, well personally i am working on trying to level it all out so that everybody is covered adequately in the class you know yeah it's work in progress but we live and we learn 
Oh yeah, that's that's those are beautiful contributions. And and I think I really like that even in our, in the flow of the conversation so far, we've pointed out the fact that um typical learners have needs and gifted children also have needs. And and we need to make sure that quality education is accessed by all kinds of learners, right? That's why we actually talk about quality education for all, not just those with special needs as diagnosed, but but also those that are typical learners and those that are gifted learners. Um, thank you very much for the contribution so far. But I know as um, Emanuela started off in answering that question, it just really made a natural segue to um, the question about um, settings. How do you, what, what's, what is proper? What would you um, suggest or recommend? Or what have you found in your practice as most beneficial? Would it be heterogeneous group settings or homogeneous group settings? Would you? Would it be um, where you have typical learners, gifted learners, and special ed learners in uh, students with special needs in one group? Or would you have homogeneous students with just particular special needs in those groupings? Um, I think Mr. Uh, Victory can, can, can chime in here. As a school head, what do you see as, as practicable and most beneficial? Yeah, thank you very much. I hope you can hear me well. Yeah, we can. Okay, thank you very much once again for this opportunity. Uh, let me quickly lend my voice to quickly uh, iron out something, about to just support something that has been said earlier before I jump into the uh, categorization of the children. Now, in 2016, we had a, a national conference of curriculum developers in uh, Calabar. During that conference, there's something we did that some have, have not been uh, we are not bringing into perspective here that special needs is not just about the um the disabled nor the uh, gifted there is a group of special needs which are the disadvantaged these people we try to design the curriculum to also accommodate them and i think uh experts who are here in special needs should help us to see how they can uh, uh, accept this fact that there is no this particular people, the disadvantaged. Now, depends on your, on your geographical climb. If you go up north, you will see that the disadvantaged are uh, taking a chunk of the bulk for special needs children. So let me quickly drop that and appeal that we look at how we can uh, holistically uh, take these children. Now, coming back to the issue at hand, uh, whether we we'll go heterogeneous or homogeneous, just like uh, what one of uh, Majusha Kabu said earlier, uh, we don't want to label anybody. However, the truth must be told. Putting these children together in an, in a heterogeneous class, the gifted, the disadvantaged, the um, the disabled, and the normal regular, what we call normal regular children, obviously you will see that the teacher will have so much to, so much balls to juggle, so much uh, children to, so much, you know, drawbacks and so much push forwards. So uh, in order not to seem as if we are uh, labeling a particular set of children or trying to in quotes, hype a particular set, will definitely go, for me personally, I'll go for the uh, homogeneous system However, or what I would call the quasi homogeneous, you can find a way to draw. There should be a common ground for them all. There should be a common point for them all to come and learn. However, there are certain uh, subjects, certain learning goals, certain learning, uh, you know, things that they may need to split to give pay special attention, especially in this category. But we must always come to a point that. We should be able to bring all these children to a common ground. Let them have a common denominator. Let them know that first of all, they are children, and they are just they are normal children, but having uh, to, to have some special attention as a result of uh, certain things. So for me, I think I'll go with the quasi homogeneous uh, system instead of just the heterogeneous of putting them together in one place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Victory. Uh, can I just pipe in? Um, Personally, I prefer a heterogeneous group because you have all the abilities over there and those uh, who are high ability can always help 
those uh, who have you know needs and it's also challenging for those who have needs to look up and take on the challenge and you know perform so instead of putting them all in one class and differentiation teachers when they differentiate their planning everybody uh, will benefit and everybody can see success and will give children more confidence and will raise their self-esteem so i would prefer and which is something done in our school is a mixed group of high ability middle ability and low we won't differentiate them but the teachers can differentiate the planning the kids can help each other and uh, everybody sees success to the best of their ability yes good afternoon um, yeah, I think I'm also, yes please i'll also go with the heterogeneous learning because you have children with different ability in one space uh, like um um, Kapoor said, um, you have the children who are high also helping those that are low and then the low looking up to the children who are high to learn. You know, children learn best from themselves. Sometimes as a teacher, you allow your children to teach themselves. So for example, you have a class where you have students struggling in terms of expressing themselves verbally, you know, you have the shy ones who cannot communicate. And then in that same class, you have someone who is very high in expression, communicating, you know, and then you see the other one learning from the other student who is very good at what they do. So having children with mixed abilities in the same class, I will really go for that because it also is, it's, it's a, it, it, it's a better way for me for teaching and for everyone to learn together. Okay, um, to mm. add to what they've just said about the heterogeneous homogeneous, I think um, I, we all, in all the schools I've taught, it's not, um, it's not a hard and fast rule. There are some times when you need to pull them out, and there are some times when they can stay in class. So as someone mentioned about getting the teachers involved, getting all the people in the school involved. So you have the subjects where they have specialized teachers. Some students have shadow teachers, so they cannot be in class with their peers. Then you have to come to like the special department room, you work on your subject with your teacher because your your um, benchmarks your um, you know your curriculum ha will have been modified to meet you at your level with your needs so in this situation i would suggest what and what has worked for the school for the schools i've been in you have the subjects that they will do with their peers maybe swimming music drama you know things that pe even depending on what how severe their physical needs are and then you have like the academic subjects like math science language um, history, stuff like that, where they need a differentiated curriculum just to at least make the minimum level of understanding of the objective. So it, I think the school has to be flexible enough to be like, um, we're not going to be like putting them, because really putting them in a homogeneous class, yes, they, they all have the same needs, they are all similar, but it also kills their confidence because they may not know how to interact. In the real world, I always say there's no special needs in the workplace. In the workplace, whether you have a need or not, you're going to be expected to perform. So we need to start getting them ready to interact with other people don't see your need as a crutch, but see it as something that makes you unique and use it to your best um, you know, ability. So what has worked, like I said, yeah, you have your subjects for homogeneous learning and you have heterogeneous because they need to interact. Every child wants to fit in when they are young. And that's what um, worries a lot of children with needs, that they don't fit in, that they stand out until they grow old and they realize that, hey, it's okay to actually stand out and be different. But at this age, so as much as possible, when you put them in a, you know, for the subjects that they need the one-on-one, -on -one, they need the shadow teacher and they are doing well and they are succeeding. By the time they go to join the, their pairs in a music class, even if they are not, you know, singing as well as the others, but in the morning, like, okay, well, this morning in math, you know, I did really well with my shadow teacher and, you know, that, that happiness is still there. So even if they don't do as well in the music, it's actually, they won't feel as bad as, if they were in the same class with the same people doing the same thing all day and then they are looking like well all these people will all have needs what have i really achieved like so i think there should be a balance between mm -hmm. you know subjects the curriculum the timetabling the school should really consider that if you want to be like truly um inclusive i would say I actually mm, okay agree. Uh, thank you uh, thank, thank you so thank you so Okay. I, I actually okay. agree with Norma. That's yeah. the same experience I've had. It actually depends on the activity or the subject. And some students, I remember I had the students in my class, I had an external facilitator. Um, I think uh, one was an occupational therapist and the other one was just an, a, a facilitator from another agency that would come pull her out from class at a particular time on some days of the week. 
and you know have their session with her and whatnot so it was kind of mixed in, at least in the two experiences i've had it was always mixed it just it depends on the situation then it will call for um um at which part we're doing around homogeneous or heterogeneous but one thing was sure was the differentiation the teacher used in class we used a tabling um, method colors of tables we had the amber the uh, what do you call it the red and the and the green but after a while that was scrapped because children didn't want to be at a particular table you know because they already knew what it's yeah. connoted so after a while the um, yeah. dos yeah. changed that totally and made it um so um it depends on the way you're doing well in class that day you know and not just academically even your behavior if you're behaving in a certain type of way that is not um, socially acceptable obviously you get to the red one so it was all mixed up they just used different types of style just to include everyone and to make sure there was a kind of balance basically okay i i just um pm p back right you know what you just um said and um, manuela just that fact of having labels and categories of tables for example could could go the wrong way and i i think it, it was really um beautiful to see that um, as teachers, as um, heads, we were sensitive to the implication of that. I were able to, to make it more dynamic. So from what I've gathered so far about addressing that question, there's the need for flexibility, there's the need for differentiation that comes from teachers, and then there's the need to carry everyone along, everyone who is involved in that child's life. So let's talk about carrying people along. Um, in your experience, what, what are some of the strategies you have used to help carry parents along and teachers along, um, as well as teachers that are um, non-special ed teachers, right? Because I think it's, there's some sort of a challenge, sometimes a tension, sometimes a uh, misunderstanding that happens with the multiple people involved in, in meeting the needs of a, a child with special needs. So, so let's talk about your experience um, in dealing with that. Okay, um, can I say, I wanted to say something on the, well, it's similar to what your question has addressed now, <laughs> basically on the differentiation yeah. in the classroom. So I, in my, when I taught grade three, we had our reading groups. So of course they, they had to sit in their ability levels. I think them, I'm like, okay, well, these people are reading this level, you are reading this level, but you can also get to their level if you, you know, put in the effort, like do your 20 minutes of reading at home pay attention during the reading lesson and um, teaching like, uh, well, I was lucky to have excellent classroom assistants at the time. So everyone, and then I found that teaching the whole class when you have children with needs, this was even before I knew about children with needs is a bigger challenge. But when you teach in smaller groups, when you've assigned your tasks to each group, mm -hmm. they are sitting together in a way that you can navigate the class and give everybody your attention. It's better than trying to teach the whole class, the whole concept. What do I mean by this? So let me use my, my reading groups. So I did my reading groups for grade three. Where there were four groups, low, middle, 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 and high. So I'd make sure that in a week, I have to have read with each group at least once so that they know. So they all have their books. We had a library. Your level books are there for your level, but I've also assigned you a book based on the level I know you are at. So like my students with dyslexia, uh, ADHD, they were usually in that year, three class, they were all together. By this time, I wasn't even, I was still studying with my, to do my special needs qualification, but I had put them in that group to read together. So I'd make sure that I'm reading with them. So the prize was, if you finish reading your book, you answer your comprehension questions for me, you do the task, you know, related, you either get, you know, free time in the library, or you get to read to the people in the other group to show them what you've done. Because trust me, children like showing off. So this worked for all the groups. So I'm like, anyone that finishes the task in the required reading time, maybe more 45 minutes, if you can finish all these things, you have a comprehension task, you have the reading task, you have some other activities to do, you get to read to the other group. In on days when I find that everybody's finishing at the same time, I'm like, okay, okay, okay. You guys can have extra free time like to play or whatever. And then you all come to me like one-on-one -on -one in the course of the week to make sure that you read just with me, just me and you reading. And I found that that helped. It made my reading classes more manageable. It motivated the reluctant readers to read. And even the ones that did not like reading, because at the time, like I said, I wasn't fully versed in special ed. Children with dyslexia hated reading aloud. So they would rather just have the chance to read with me. 
than have to read with everyone else. So that really works for me, like the differentiated reading and stuff like that. For subjects like math and all that, as she's saying, yeah, to handle the tension from teachers, I feel their pain because it is hard to teach about 15 children on different levels, the same topic. But as they get their, you know, their IEPs and their diagnosis, from the accommodations, you know that you have to modify their benchmarks. So usually your differentiation has to be very, very to the T. So for example, in a math lesson, if you are doing angles, you know, let me say um, shapes, at least the basic. So everyone yeah. should know the different shapes, properties of shapes, and maybe um, you know, how to find the perimeter and area. So you know your children with special needs, they may probably not get to that level of finding the perimeter and area, but they need to know about shapes. So you differentiate your lessons in a way that you're going to have activities for each of these things in your math class. They're going to have activities identifying shapes. They're going to have activities identifying their properties. They're going to have activities on perimeter and area. Yeah, and then, yeah. So you have at least three workstations in your classroom for the week. So the first day, of course, your high achievers, they may probably run through everything and you can extend them. I'm like, okay, now find, you know, perimeter and area of shapes in our class. Get a ruler, measure this, find the perimeter, get this, get that, and you get it. And then you know that your children that are struggling, they are going to struggle through even just to get to the point where they know the property of a square. So then if you've differentiated it that way, your challenges will be fewer because you know that everybody's working at their own pace. And then you use like different things, like use videos, use games, go outside, like to teach multiplication once, I use basketball. So you bounce a ball, you say the answer. And even my kids we need were able to pick it up faster because they are moving, they are outside, they, they are having fun, but they are learning there. But so teachers, it's a lot of work. To, but even like in that basketball lesson, trust me, even my tension was reduced because it would be funny when someone got the answer wrong, we'll just laugh and give the correct answer. So teachers will need to be like very creative, very, um, you know, are very patient, especially yeah, if you, you, you need to have that extra dose of patience when you have children with needs in your class that have not been diagnosed with a need and maybe the parents are not going to accept that their child ever has a need. So those are some of the tensions I think like teachers just get very creative, you know, use a variety of resources to get your point across and then just identify your key objectives for each child at their ability level so that you don't get frustrated when your child with needs is not able to find the area and perimeter, they can only stop our shapes and stuff like that. And then, yeah, so you really, you really have to do your differentiation to the T, but that's why me, that's why I love my role as the Senko, but that's why I come in to help you to see how we can make it happen for you and make your life as a teacher a happier experience with your children with um, needs. Yeah, so that's something that I would say has worked for me. Like put play, put videos, take your lesson outside the classroom and yeah, it, it, things happen, things happen. Oh, that, that's, that was really helpful. And I'm sure um, teachers who are here and have uh, multiple ability learners would, would um, benefit from what you have just shared. Yes, go ahead Manjusha. Yeah, I was also saying the teachers also can use uh, formative assessments like assessment for learning. So okay. that's a continuous process of assessing your children. And then you know where to jump in and do you need to recap the lesson or, you know, you know who needs the recapping, who can carry on. So you have uh, different ways to assess the lesson at the end. You can do three to one, you can do lollipop sticks or those uh, sticks which are red, green, and amber. Green tells you, yes, I've understood the topic, I can carry on. Amber tells you, I need a little bit of help, you know, and then I can move on. And the red obviously means you need uh, recapping. So there are different ways that teachers can also use uh, the formative way to assess their lesson and understand how many kids have really understood and how many, you know, how many do they really need to help or just redo the topic again because maximum, you know, children would benefit if they recapped the lesson objective. So assessment for learning is quite helpful in the classroom uh, for teachers to assess how far the learning has taken place uh, for a given topic. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for handling that. All right. Um, so um, I know we, Norma and Manjusha have talked about um, teachers and how they, they can handle some of the tension with differentiation, with multisensory approaches, with, with working with a Senko like Norma that really um, has their game on. Um, and, and I know Manjusha talked about the formative assessment, right? Assessment 
for learning. So you're progressively assessing um, the child to know where it is that there's been a breakdown and you can reteach if you need to do it or re-emphasize, reiterate something. Let's talk about tension with parents. Um, when Unoma was answering a question earlier, you talked about um, some parents who do not accept or admit that their child has um, a need that they need support with. Um, Mr. Victory, I don't know if your school setting has, um, has had that encounter with parents who do not want to see or do not see or cannot see. Um, how do you deal with that? How have you dealt with that? Yeah, thank you very much. Um... Uh, we have had cases of this nature in a time past. Uh, like she has rightly said, parents don't want to hear anything, especially when it comes negative about their children. All their interest has always been uh, tell them something beautiful, something good, something they want to hear. And, uh, but however, we need to tell them the truth. So the first thing we do is once the teacher reports a particular uh, case of a child, based on his observation. We, first of all, invite the therapist, invite uh, the psychologist to look through and uh, assess and be sure of uh, the situation. And of course, we have a plan in mind to remedy the situation, to assist the child rather. But before we, it should, it could implement much, we will obviously invite the parents to the office. Now, what I tell my teachers as head of school is, uh, do not take these things up on your own. There are official proceedings, processes for everything. You can't just observe a child and take it up and move to the parents and say, ah, um, Mrs. Jones, for instance, your child has this difficulty and all that. No, it doesn't work. You we invite the child, the official management of advise the child to the office and uh, sorry, the parents rather, and talk them through it, uh, take them through it, let them see how much work we have done so far, let them see the, the plan we have for the child, and then just let them come to them. Then we will not end by without giving them their own share of responsibility and tell them, ah, please, this is what we want you to do. This is our own, uh, what we are saying you should do in the house, especially when it comes to probably things like homework, and uh, things uh, of that nature. Now, we have had cases where we have uh, had to invite the parents alongside with, if they have maybe a caregiver, uh, maybe somebody like a, um, a home teacher or a private tutor, to come with the person. Uh, we, have, we have had our observation, we have done our research, we have done our findings, uh, we will then come together on the table. It's a group work, it's a partnership work, We'll sit down together and be able to come to terms. But in the case where we just throw it at the parent and say, oh, Ms. Jones, your child is this, your child is that, the parents are finding it difficult to wrap their hand around this. What is this people, what are these people saying? My child is normal, my child is this, is good child. And they don't really know what to do because obviously they are not professionals. We giving them an information with a plan, we go a long way to really help them come to terms with it and accept it and so okay fine if you think this plan will work fine go ahead and execute it and you will see that within a short time the parents are able to acclimatize to the system and uh we move on thank you very much all right thank you mr vicky info with a plan so not just information by itself but information with a plan yes no i see you're itching to say something uh, yeah i would just yeah, add thank you. What said exactly you, you the parents like to be carried along the, and then the parents usually are in denial for a while. So in my experience, what we do is um, we, the teacher observes, she will report like, you know, this child in the first six weeks, everybody's here, this child is not yet there. So we give you at least two terms. The first term, six weeks, there's a midterm assessment, there's an end of term assessment. By the middle of the second term, if we see that there's no pro progress, you know, we call the parents in, you know, we've noticed this, that the meeting will be like, we, I'm talking from my experience, though I don't know how it happens. Though. But basically, we meet with the special needs coordinator and the head of school and the home uh, classroom teacher. This is what we've observed. We've been in school for about uh, 12 weeks now. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, about 12 weeks now. We have not seen much progress. We would like to observe your child again up to the end of this second term. And if we still do not see any progress, we would like to recommend that 
you know, we get an external party to come and assess to tell us exactly what kind of support your child needs. Nine, let me say six times out of 10, the parents will say, no, there's nothing wrong with my child. It is your school. You people don't know how to teach my child. My child is like this, like that. My child likes this. My child likes that. So we listen to you. We're like, okay, in the meantime, for the rest of this second term, this is the plan we're going to keep for them. It's like a temporary learning plan before we actually give them an I, an individualized education plan. We're going to use these strategies for the rest, next six weeks to the end of term two. Let's see, you know, how it progresses, if we see any change, based on what the parents tell us, like, oh, my child likes this, my child likes that, you people are not doing this, you people are not doing that, it is this child in the class that is disturbing him, that is why he's not doing that. Okay, fine, we do sitting arrangements, we do everything, and then we do our uh, plan. And if we still don't see any you know, progress by the end of that term, in the end of term report, it will be indicated your child is still not making you know, as much progress as we would require for this for his age level. By the end of grade three, of term three, if there's still, still no progress, we would seriously recommend you take your child for an assessment. This way, we are able to provide the adequate support your child needs to learn. Um, that thing of parents are always afraid of you labeling their child. They're trying to say, well, I can't say my child has something. And I'm, I always rebuff with like, I'm not saying your child has something. I'm saying your child learns differently. We need to know how your child is learning so that we can make the learning happen. If we keep insisting on teaching your child in the same way, it's not a one size fits all for education. We need to know the size that fits your child. Usually, it's, as you said, the parents will, once you have the plan and the information they want, they will usually uh, for exactly what he said. So I think that happens everywhere. Parents just want to be sure that even if you are telling me this, okay, what do you want, what do you want me to do? And what are you also going to do? Because it's usually a home school affair. We can't be differentiating in school and then your child is going home to sleep and play computer all day. It, 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 there has to be some things done at home. And depending on the kind of needs for students with like ADHD and the other executive functioning challenges, they may be academically sound or maybe even the dyspraxia. They may be academically sound, but because they are not able to coordinate their movements, organize themselves, you know, get information, know what they have to do first, next, and last in an orderly manner, they may not do well. So even these things, sometimes you will have to send a plan home with the parents, like at home, when they get home, after dinner, they need to do this for a while, they need to do that. Some children, we recommend like occupational therapy. Some need um, normal, you know, like um, therapy, general emotional therapy as well. So the parents also have to, do their part at home, as he's saying, because we're, we've given you the information. We've told you what you have to do, because we all can't do it in school alone. And we need to follow up on each other. I've had parents that I had to ask, like, if your child did not sleep well, I came to school grumpy in the morning, please let me know, because this really affects the way her day is going to be. And it really works. And the parents are on board. They send me a text, oh, this happened at breakfast. Expect some challenges from her today because she's not happy. That, so that way, as she's coming into the class, the teacher already knows, ah, this happened in breakfast, so let's, you know, thread carefully on how we bring things to her today. But it really helps because the parents have to do their part. Because if we don't know that there was a challenge at breakfast time, she comes to school, she has not done her homework. She's like, okay, people that have not done their homework, this is gonna happen. She's already upset like in my homework. And my homework, I didn't do it because of something my parents did like, your challenges and, you know, it's the case of nobody rest and, you know, yeah. So we, 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 as much as possible, parents, they have to be on board. They can't just leave it to the school that they, you, you know, whatever we're doing in school, parents have to follow up at home they have to just be engaged and do their own part. And I've seen it work when parents are engaged and they follow up. And I've seen it also not work when the parents just leave it to the school to um, handle everything, yeah. In our school also, we need parental consent even to pull the child out of class. So after the teachers have put in enough of strategies mm -hmm. and ha collected enough of evidence that, you know, we did this differently, that and it's still not working. And when we have the parent meeting, we do need parental consent to pull the child out to give extra intervention. Because again, it's a society thing of being labeled. I don't want my child to go to the sand room. You know, parents don't particularly care much for like the same call. Oh my God, no, it's, you know, that kind of a thing. But uh, yeah, parental consent is very, very important. It's best to keep them informed informal meetings homeschool diaries in whichever way you know you start off slowly uh breaking the news to them that you know he needs what is if this something happened at home parent could be traveling there could be a death in the family and the child is not performing so uh we need that connect between uh parents and the school 
to see how best uh, to help the child. It could be a passing phase or it could be something uh, more serious. Mm. All right. So yeah, it could be a passive phase or it could be something more serious. But what about the times where it's something more serious, you have communicated with the parents, you've given them information, there's a plan in place, maybe you have someone coming to do pull outs with the child and the parents expect magic to happen. How do you deal with that ex expectation of magic? Um, Salamatu, we haven't heard your voice in a while, and I know you have been involved at the Senko as a coordinator, yeah. right? So how yeah. how is it that you have how have you helped parents to deal with managing expectations? Yes, um, from the beginning, you let them understand what exactly you are working with with their child. They need to be involved from um, mm. the planning, the doing, and then the reviewing. So from your planning, you are putting in your outcomes and you're letting them know the time frame for each outcome or each um, target you have or goals you have with their child. And then you are also educating them from the beginning, allowing them to understand that it's not magic. It's something, it's a gradual process. It's something that they will see the results if they put their if they put their effort at home and we also in school also do ours. Working with parents to me is, I think working with special needs children is easy working with them in school, but then working with parents, that's where it's even more challenging because several times you have parents coming to challenge you like from the beginning why are you even saying my child has this needs my child at home is doing this my child can my child speaks at home my child's play and then you're asking questions like okay who does he play with at home and then they're telling you and um, he's playing with his dad okay does he have a cousin a, long, a younger cousin how does he like walk and play with his cousins his neighbors and they're telling you well with, that, with my neighbor he's not playing you know he doesn't play with them but he plays he talks okay what does he really tell you at home does he say mommy i want to drink water and they're like no but when he wants water he's pulling me towards you know so when you allow them explain what they feel is like the, their own achievement for their child then during, during, during the process, they begin to understand that, okay, yes, there's a process, okay, there's a problem. Okay, I need to come on board now. Okay, so what do we do? So you are carrying them every step along the way. And also, another way to reduce the whole parent um, um, challenges in school is from the beginning, from the entry point, how they, when they come into the school, from admission processes, how they're coming in. So we are, in my school, we are, we, we start from there. So you are bringing in your child, we are assessing you from day one. And if we notice anything, we are asking the parent there. Okay, we notice this during the course of the interview, during the course of the assessment. Um, what have you done? Most parents will try to hide it and then we tell them, okay, before you before you can even come into the school, you need to have this checks done before you come in. So from the beginning, we are also attacking it there. And then some parents will not even tell us. And then after we observe this and we talk with them, they now come in with reports that have been done two years before the admission processes. So with that, we tend to reduce all that. So the parents are fully aware before they even come into the school that, oh, we know you're coming in or we know your child has this problem. And then also when you, your last, the question you asked last is how do parents um, take progress? Okay, how do they want to see, okay, they want to see the progress happening fast. Like I said, you need to tell them from the beginning. There's always a time frame to setting goals. And we also let them know that if by the end of the term, Salamatu is not able to attain this um, target, we might be extending the targets, maybe changing our strategies. So we are always letting them know from the beginning that this is how the plan is going to be and this is how we work. And even when we now record progress, we carry them along. Another thing is that parents will tell you, okay, my, my child can talk, my child can do this. What then, why do we still need to have these um, um, interventions, or we still have to have people coming, we still have to pay for therapy, and then you're not explaining that. Remember, our target was to deal with him expressing his little needs. Now we want him to have proper understanding. So it's like every step you are breaking it down for them to properly understand what you are doing with the child. And also the teachers, you know, the teachers constantly always have to give the feedback to their parents. Also managing the words and how they 
um, de deliver the message to the parents. And that's why it's really, really advisable that before such information goes, goes out to parents, you are carrying your head teacher, you are carrying the same, you are carrying, even the head of school is supposed to be aware of how you are passing your information because you don't want an instance where your um, teacher A is saying B, the same is saying C, and then the school doesn't, the school is not even aware of the progress plan of the child. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Salamatu. Yeah, and just to add to what she said, like she said, we, we don't be aware of the plan. And uh, some, I don't know, but something that I found works is in the school admissions policy for SEN. It's also because some parents come with the idea that if they have a therapist, they do the OT, you know, if they have the shadow teacher, their child will be cared somehow and will be able to. So it, it's, it's a tough conversation I have when I say like, um, there's no cure for these conditions, really. But our job as teachers is to make sure that your child can live a, as a full life and become as independent as possible. And just like she said, you have to keep reviewing the plans. If they don't meet the targets you set, you have to train, change your strategies. You may have to even change the targets when you find out that some things, unfortunately, may just not be achievable. Or it will take, I've had a child that it took four years to learn how to learn division from like grade four to year seven. So every time we're reviewing the plan, learning division was part of it, learning division was part of it, until he got it, it took four years. Not a lot of parents are that patient, but they have to explain, you have to explain to them why, yeah. you know, they shouldn't get disappointed, they should just celebrate, because every child makes progress. Some may not make as much as the parents would like, but any progress is progress. So you have to be flexible with your planning, with your goal setting, and as she said, once you carry the parents along and you explain to them why, you know, you're modifying the plan, I, I, I don't think they will be that um, upset. I think it's when, as you, she said, you just surprise them with like, oh, my, your child cannot do this, your child cannot, and then they're like, um, but why, you know, at home, they, they do this, they do that. And then parents know their children. They don't know a, a vast range of children. So they may not know what is typical for a child and what is a typical. So they may think, you know, everything is fine at home because they can do certain, you know, things. And yeah, so as she said, as Salamatu said, just carry your parents along and just explain. <laughs> You don't feel like lost or surprised or shocked, you know. Yeah. Thank you, Noma. Please, may I add I, something I here? Go on, Mr. Victory. Go on. Yeah, thank you. Just to uh, further strengthen what um, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Salamat for Jules uh, noted. Now, I want to uh, lay emphasis that. Teachers, uh, information we are passing to parents along the line at each stage as we are making progress must be harmonized. She hinted it, but I just want to elaborate on that because uh, I, as school head, have, we have had this difficulty that there are some information, parents, we have the information and we're not even aware of the progress. We're not even aware. And some, some, sometimes this information may be a little bit uh, twisted and uh, not reflecting the, the true position of what the school wants to pass across. So I want to appeal to our teachers here that any information, before it goes out to parent, there must be harmony. It must be harmonized with all other uh, you know, players in the field. Because taking care of this child, it's not just your own observation. Now we had a scenario, <clears throat> sorry, when we had to even uh, get information from the, the non-academic staffs about the particular child, you know, and the non-academic staffs like the caregivers, the other persons, you know, who take care of these children. And so it is when the school head gets these information, both from classroom, because learning is not just always in a classroom, uh, in, during, you know, uh, you know, break time, uh, on their way to the restroom, there are some disposition, there are some things they pick up, some attitude they pick up or they, they, or they show them that the, you know, persons in those areas needs to feed the school head that will harmonize the, you know, the report that the school head will pass across. So just to add that, please, any information given out to parents should come, should originate from the table of either the head teacher or the school head, and it should be an harmonized information, including both what is happening in the classroom and what is happening outside the classroom. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Mr. Victory. It must be very uncomfortable to have conversations with parents where one group of um, people are blindsided or 
do not know what is going on, right? So yes, that harmonization of communication of what goes out is, is very important. So um, I know there's some parents here. Thank you. So let, let's look at it from that side. Um, for those parents, what, what should they look out for for a school that offers to provide support for their children who have some special needs? What are the things that parents should really look out for? What are the things that parents should ask for? What are the things that parents should question when it's not happening? Um, for a parent that have a special needs child coming into a school, the first thing you need to know mm. if the structure can accommodate your child. It could be physical structure, mm. It could be um, academic provision. Is the school sent aware? Are the teachers trained? Do you have a special needs department? Um, how are you pull out section? Do you allow external facilitators, shadow teachers with my children? You know, first you need to ask uh, how involved is the school community with special need? What are the activities you do to celebrate or to or, or how or how how is the school's um, inclusive um, inclusiveness really is it, it being sold out out there? You know, for example, are other children in the school even aware that their school is a place that cater for other children that need that extra um, um, assistance? You know, so these are the questions you should ask, and then you should you should also be patient to go around the school and see the classroom, and to also to understand. Most parents don't understand what the curriculum is all about, so when we ask them to start asking, what is the curriculum? How does it help my child? But I think basic questions first: How is the structure? Are the teachers sent aware? Is the school involved? And how do you how do you celebrate your special needs children in your school? And also, parents should also be um also be should they should also be able to express and tell the school the truth too you know when you come in you should be able to tell the school everything about your child because it's when you are telling the school okay i have a child that has this need this need it also helps the school plan and also let you know if they have the basic accommodation for your child in their school so i'm going to give an example um i'm a parent taking my child who who maybe who is on a wheelchair and uh, not just being on the wheelchair now, maybe the child also has some sensory issue, and then my child also have uh, maybe poor com um, comprehension, um, comprehension skill. But the obvious need there is that the child is physical, the child is on the wheelchair, that is what the school can see at the point of entry, and that is what the parents have only told the school. So in my school, we might say no, because we might say no, because we don't even have a room for you to come into the school. So the structure may not even allow you to come into our premises. But, but some schools may actually have that in place and say, okay, fine, you can come in. And then the child is coming in and the school is only limited to knowing that it's only a physical need that they are only going to deal with. And then they realize the child has other needs. At that time, the school might be at that, at, at that time, there may be a delay even proper intervention because the school might just want to focus on what they what they got from the parents and maybe the reports they've also gotten from the parents. But if parents are also um, sincere from the beginning, if I can use that word, it also helps the school in planning and also telling you what they can provide for your child. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah. You wanted to say something, Mr. Victory? Yeah, yeah. Just to add and strengthen what uh, has already been said. Now, at the point of admission, the fact is parents will not always be truthful. I've had cases to jump on by in the admission process, and the admission officer will ask, how is this, how is that? And uh, based on the overwhelming and definite response from parents, the, the admission officer, or whoever is conducting the test, may be a little bit trying to shift ground and be a little bit soft, and thereby yeah, they will not be able to detect some of these uh, shortcomings. So I want to appeal and recommend that we keep our eyes blinded to whatever recommendation letters they bring, whatever high-rated performance they may mark their own child to or assign to their children. Let's have our checklist. And let's follow that checklist to the letters. Let's take because uh, it is it is a popular saying that before you begin the roof, when you are beginning the foundation of a house, 
you need to decide the roofing structure you put on it. If you, you cannot decide on it at the early stage, it will be a problem. Now, this is where most schools run into a challenge. They just want to grab the children in, not wanting to, like, uh, uh, Madam uh, uh, Salaman to say, but can we really take care of this child? It's not something you will be sentimental about. So at the stage of admission, check everything you need to check. Dot your eyes, cross your teeth. Does this child have the ability to feed, to feed into our own system? If you don't have the structure, physical or otherwise, to accommodate such child, then it is best you uh, maybe allow them to search for some other place. Because in the long run, if you accept that child in, it will just be from one you know, uh, issue with the parent to another issue with the parent. And at the end of the day, you won't deliver and you may even block other potential parents coming in. Thank you. Okay, so thank you very much, Mr. Victory. Uh, for, for secondary school especially, if your child is coming into a secondary school, apart from all these, ask also what qualification can my child end up with? Will your child be able to mm. standardize a GCSE or IB certificate or persons at Excel? Those are the questions parents need to ask. Because usually when we, uh, we in, where I work presently, we will have that conversation with you. Like from what your child is doing, we don't know if your child can get the standardized IGCSE certificate or whatever it is you know, the school offers. So be prepared to know that they may just get mm. this certificate from the school as an institution, not a generalized one. Also, parents need to know, yes, in yeah. these situations, what are their options? for university, for further education, for technical colleges. So those are the questions parents also need to ask on admission. So that, you know, you know you're not three years into secondary and then when they tell you this, you're not like, oh, but you didn't tell me when the child came in year seven. And then, as he said, uh, as Mr. Victory said, that's another uh, bone of contention for you. Yeah, please, and one more thing for parents, you could also ask for the same teacher to be present during your admission process so you can direct your questions to the same teacher. Yeah, that can also help. I don't know. I don't know how free you are as a same teacher, but Salamatu, it's hard for you to be in those meetings because, like, it's hard. I know, but sometimes some parents will still request that. Okay, can I just have one or two that you can see? And I also, <laughs> I understand. I've I've done a few, but it is it's hard. I, I see what you mean, and I I really feel like it would have helped if people had like told me. But what we do now, I work very closely with admissions. So when she's yes. getting school information, we just read through it first. Then we decide, yes. okay, we're we going to do this. Are we going to go further? Are we going to not for, go further? Or we arrange like a separate meeting all together. Like after you do your admission, just come and see the teacher, the same teacher, one on one. Because we used to we try that works. school by works day. But man, it, it was crazy. So th yeah, so now we're like, okay, let's look at it. What do you think? Okay, this person will need a one-on-one -on -one with you. When are you free? Yes. The then, yeah, because yeah, it's a good idea. I wish we could, but yeah, it's so hard. Because usually admissions happen during the holiday when we're not there. So by the time you come, you give me all these people that are like, so now I'm like, eh, eh, please, mm -hmm. if they need a meeting, eh, just let's know before, worst case, beginning of the school year. So that we are not, um, yeah. Because for me now, I'm doing secondary. Yeah. I love doing sen in primary. Actually, it was so much less stressful. But in secondary, it gets a, it, it, it's really tough if the teacher had to sit in on um, the admissions process as well. It's a good idea. Well, I feel you, but hey, my dear, it was a bit tough. <laughs> and one thing, um, my parents uh, at admissions is that sometimes when you have children coming at pre-nursery or junior nursery. Um, it's obviously very difficult. Uh, parents themselves may not know that they are in hands uh, learning disability, you know, which we may see in school. And then, of course, you have your meetings and we realize they're not speaking or not reaching their milestones, but you've already taken in the child. So it's, again, it goes back to the previous question is that keep the parents informed, have your meetings, let them know the milestones that they have achieved in, uh, according to pre-nursery, junior nursery, whichever EYFS class they are. And um, if they're above uh, two years old, they can, you know, at least meet the speech therapist and try and get indicators if there is uh, a deeper learning disability or they're just late bloomers uh, 
as far as uh, speech is concerned. You know, we all know girls tend to talk um, earlier than boys do, but uh, it's, it's a red flag at certain age if they are not meeting their milestones. Um, but you've already taken in the child and uh, probably parents may, first child, they may not you know, realize that these are the milestones that they should have covered. And so now you have to see the next step forward. What best can we do as a school uh, for that child till they are officially uh, assessed and uh, by a psychologist and said, okay, they have uh, this disability or that disability. So sometimes we do face those kind of uh, issues in our school because they've come in at pre-nursery uh, and then we, by the end of that year or junior nursery, or, we realize that no, there is something amiss over here and uh, we need to speak to the parents. Then we have our meetings to say, what are they doing at home? Are they you know, pulling your hand or are they able to say things? And then take the next step forward from there and see how best we can uh, accommodate them in our school with our, the provisions that we have in our school. So sometimes at admission, it's really difficult to uh, say if, uh, get all the information. It just kind of comes up uh, during the pace of the year, especially in EYFS and junior classes. Mm. All right. Thank you uh, for highlighting that, Man uh, Manjusha, and letting um, us get perspective into that. Um, I think it's it's is really interesting to see with all the input that we've had from the panelists, it just goes to show how an open line of communication is very important. At whatever point that is happening, it's important that it is open and that it is honest. And I'm sure that the parents here um, have taken a, um, a thing or two away that they can um, take with them when they're looking out for those schools that would support um, their children who have needs. Um, no, my, I think I found it very interesting. In our setting, um, it's not very common to find Senko in secondary schools, especially with, with, with the general, with low-income private schools or private schools in low-income areas or even government schools, right? So it must be really interesting to navigate those waters with, with teachers, with class teachers, with subject teachers, because things are very separated in, in secondary school level. Can you just shed a little light on on how it is that you, you what do you find um, about working in that setting? Secondary, like I said, usually the children, we already know who they first, we, they have come from primary with their reports, their IEPs, so they already have plans in place. So it's a little bit easier to just get them into the system. The challenge may be new coming students that did not do primary in our school, but I, I I've done two secondary schools now. So the challenge is like if they did, if we were not aware and then we discover it in the term. But basically it's um, in secondary, it's more meetings, more individual meetings with subject teachers, more uh, parent meetings, more check-ins, more liaising with um, the school management because now, you know, like this is like the final, they're going to do exams and stuff like that. More liaising with the examining bodies, the external um, examining bodies, um, and things like that, but basically, with a good team and a, and a, and a nice approach, really. When it, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate to have worked with very good people that are very open-minded, very aware of sen needs anyway. And usually, like I said, by secondary, we already know the students and their challenges and what they need help with, so it makes it um, so much easier. But basically, it's just the meetings and the plannings that are um, a bit of a challenge. But if, if you just you know structure your day in a way. That at least, or at least your month in a way that you are constantly in touch with everybody, touching base with all the subject teachers for your students, making sure your roster is updated, making sure parents are kept aware of every, you know, everything they need to be made, made aware of, and just carrying everybody along really, more than in, um, you had to in primary really, because primary you just had one class teacher that you're liaising with for everything, but now in secondary you're liaising with different subject teachers and children in one class may not be doing the same subjects so you have to speak to the different subject teachers for for them but basically yeah it's it's more challenging but it's also more rewarding because you you see you see the the effects of what you're doing uh, more i would say yeah mm. 
Okay. So we, we will talk about the rewards and the challenge in a bit. But um, yeah, Unoma again, and anyone who can chip in, but I, I'm particular about her because of her secondary experience. And you talked about liaising with exam bodies, right? External exam uh, institutions. So like IGCSC or Edexcel or um, WIAC. How, what has been your success? What has been your story um, in your liaising with these people? Because well, it would really be interesting to know, yeah. When I say liaising, like for the IGCSC, for the IB, to do external exams, students are also allowed accommodations and modifications to the exam um, setting. So from the IB, and yeah, I think from the IG, yeah, the IG as well, you need to have a, you know, the educational psychologist report stating what the child's special need is and okay. why they will need like maybe extra time yeah. on the assessment to be assessed in a separate room why they may need a reader or a scribe and stuff. You have to have it, the report should be at least two years old, two years by the time the exam is starting. So an exam for June, 2023, their report should not be older, should have been gotten by like 2020 mm -hmm. at the latest. A 2021 report in November will not cut it because it's going to be two years by yeah 2023. So it should be at least two years before the exam is ready so that they also, because now, like most exams are digital or they are, and stuff like that, they can actually modify how they will be assessed before the exam. So they need to have all this information. So that's basically what um, you have to do as the special needs coordinator for secondary. And then, you know, you have to know the student. And then you have to also prepare the students for these kind of exams and these kind of accommodations as well. So from year seven already, the teachers are aware that, you know, this child needs extra time. This child may need a reader. This child may need a scribe. So these are the things you have to start giving to them from year seven. So that by the time they get to year 10, 11, year 11, 12, 13, the exam classes, they know how to work with these people in exam settings. You know, because it's not enough to just say, yeah, you have the accommodations. Then in year 12, you are telling them a reader is going to read for you when they are not used to somebody um, reading for them. That could also be a yeah. chance. Yeah. So you, you have to make sure that from once they get into secondary, you are aware of their needs. The, you know, the school management is aware. We start putting our modifications and accommodations in place and everything. Because at least the IG and the IB, they have um, the English as a second language exams for the IGCSE. And then the IB also has their advanced and their regular um, maths and science and whatever classes as well. So you also know which classes the child is going to take from year seven as they go out. I think from year nine. Um, yeah, nine, ten, they start choosing their subjects and you start like differentiating for them for the final exam they're going to take for the IGCSC. There's the IGCSC for second language learners, so they, they go along that line from year 10. And then the IB also has the advanced and the regular um, classes, so they go along those lines from year 10 as well, so that they are ready for their... So even the exams have been differentiated for them. So it, it kind of makes your life a little bit easier as a teacher in secondary. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Inoma. Um, Mr. Victory, are you still with us? Um, Mr. Victory, are you still with us? Okay, it, it looks like he's off. I was just going to, I know he talked about um, curriculum writing and dealing with um, special education needs as related to the Nigerian curriculum. So I was really um, interested in hearing his take on the lies in as it relates to maybe West African exams um, and things in that sense. But I don't think he is still with us at the moment. I know he had to leave quite early, but I just didn't think he had left yet. So let's, let's move on with the conversation. Um, we will talk scenarios in a bit and, and just shed light on our different experiences in context of our classrooms or, or our roles as Senko or head of, of learning and things like that. Um, so before we do that, I just want to tell participants, um, the chat is open. If we do have questions, we could just type in our questions and I will take a bunch from time to time and ask our panelists so that they would help shed more light on some areas that um, are confusing or some areas that you just need more input or more information on. Um, so yes, the chat is open to us to, to send in our questions, but we will go on with the conversation even while we do um, wait for your questions to come in. So um, very, very quickly, I know I, I talked with a special ed um, therapist, a behavioral therapist recently, and 
she was just going over some interactions she's had with um, class teachers that are non um, special ed teachers and just what 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 stayed with me was reinforcement and she said sometimes certain teachers reinforce certain behaviors that they are really working hard to to get rid of or they're really working hard to get the child to overcome so um i would i would just like to ask in what ways can classroom teachers best support the process what ways can classroom teachers best support the process that you are uh, providing as a special ed coordinator or as a as a pull out teacher or as a shadow teacher. This is towards behavior. Yes, basically. I I think positive reinforcement is very important. The teacher's attitude herself, they shouldn't get worked up because um, Sometimes I know we do because everybody is busy, but we need to find out why is the child behaving in a particular uh, way. And the child also needs to know if she is upset, it's not because of him, it's actually the behavior. So we need to differentiate between you know, the child as a person and why, because if he has ADHD or any of these, uh, or if he has something happening at home, social, emotional, you know, behavioral, problems. Uh, it could be an impulsive reaction or a hyperactive reaction for which uh, he really doesn't have any control over it. So uh, positive reinforcement, reinf uh, classroom charts, you know, rules of what they have to follow and reward charts and uh, small things like that. Uh, and of course, you have your target sheet for the child. Uh, on you know how long can he sit for before he's allowed to take a bit of a walk or make him give him some responsibilities of distributing books or pencils whereby he gets that little bit of time to move around and is not uh, doesn't need to sit in one place uh, for a very long time so the small changes that we uh, can put in place for them rewards stickers house points whatever the school uh, has works well with uh, the primary kids, uh, especially. And of course, we um, need to f find out if this is happening only in a particular subject or it happens uh, throughout the day, because sometimes it could be work avoidance. They're finding that topic or subject difficult and uh, you know that could lead to a tantrum or something to avoid doing it. I want to go to the nurse, my stomach is, you know, paining and stuff like that. So um, we need to uh, talk to our colleagues uh, for different subjects. Does it happen in PE or is it happening only in maths? And uh, then come up with uh, strategies and, um, yeah, yeah, rewards or whatever it is to, to put in place so that the child knows that he has, my voice is echoing, sorry. Um, what he's working what towards. He's working so they towards. need to so know, need to you know, know, you know, that if you, if your if positive, you, if positive behavior, behavior is going to bring you this and always you. concentrate on the positive rather than the negative behavior, slightly ignore the negative behavior, but definitely give in more attention to positive that things that they do with class. Yeah, it's okay. It's what yeah. Said. Yeah. But, but from primary, yeah, it's easier to they, they appreciate rewards more. But I found that in secondary, what works for me to get the best behavior. Um, of course, we liaison with their teacher, goal setting, like at the beginning of the day or the beginning of the lesson. Like, so what do you want to achieve by the end of this lesson? If you can sit still, listen, and do this, what, what do you want to do? And they usually know. They're like, okay, I need to sit still. I need to finish this task. I need to check this on my classroom. I need to. So I'm like, can you make sure that you achieve this goal? And then you let me know, you know if you did it, if you were not able to do it, why were you not able to do it and stuff like that? Because in, in secondary, I found that like uh, it's a whole new world. Today. Those stickers and rewards and, it, and they all want to be like the cool kid. So they really they act like, oh, I don't care. Some will tell me like, miss, I can buy stickers for myself. And so, but in primary, they were so happy to be rewarded um, like that. So in secondary, I found like give them the chance to set their own goals, their own behavior. Goals. Like what, what, what will make you happy? Like how, how do you think you will behave today, you know, to just bring out your best? And, and usually they know the things they have to do. 
to bring. And then they're like, but miss, I just can't help myself. This, this just happens. This just, um, so I'm like, okay, let's try at least. If you say you want to do three things today, if you can even achieve one, as Mandusha said, celebrate the positives, you know, and as much as possible, ignore the negatives. If, if it's as much as possible, I say, because, um, Sometimes children know when they are being defiant and they just want to push your buttons to see how far you go. And they do it for different teachers. They have different strategies for different teachers. So they're like, how far will this teacher go? How far, well, how, what, how many wrong things can I do to this teacher? Oh, I know I can't do this to that teacher because so, so sometimes you also have to call out, you know, the negative behavior, but as much as possible, celebrate the positives more. So I think for secondary year, let them set their goals. You know what you have to do. If you set three and you achieve one, let's celebrate. If you set five, because sometimes they'll tell you like 15 things they want to do. <laughs> you know they cannot do 15 things that day. But, you're, but like, you know what? That's what you want to do, fine. Let's see where you go. So even if they do two, you can be like, well, you did two out of 15. Then maybe tomorrow we continue and we see how um, that will work for you and stuff like that. Yeah, just celebrate their successes and try to ignore the, you know, the negatives. Unless it's like, it's really extreme and you know you have to call them out. Like, this is totally unacceptable. No, it's against the school policy and uh, things like that. Yeah, but just do it, do it in love, I think. When, when they know it's coming from a place of love, they tend to behave um, more. Yeah, when they, they feel like you care, then they're like, okay. But when they feel like you just want to be mean, like, you know, they may be like, yeah, we're going head to head today and I'm not um, backing down, you know, yeah. Wow, yeah, that's, that's really beautiful to hear. Do it in love, right? That's that's a big takeaway statement from, from that. And then dwell on the positive and celebrate you two wins. Um, Mr. Victory is back, so we'll just take a pause on the, the scenario questions. Uh, Mr. Victory, are you back fully with us? Yeah, I'm back with you. Sorry for the... Okay, okay. yeah, welcome back. Um, we Just before we you left, um, I know Unama was talking about her life in with um, exam um, bodies like um, that have that offer IGCSC and then Edexcel and things like that. So I was wondering, I know at the beginning of our webinar, you talked about a curriculum meeting you had in Calabar. And I was just wondering, um, to what extent have we gone, for example, in the Nigerian setting where we use the Nigerian curriculum and students are prepared for YX, um, to what extent have we gone in providing um, accommodations and modifications for children with needs who are at that point where they need to take these exams? Yeah, thank you very much, Madam uh, Ame. You see, it's a big challenge in the Nigerian education setting as of today. I have been an advocate for vocational and educational training, uh, vocational training, and we know that we children learn in various dimensions: uh, cognitive, physical, the cognitive, the psychomotor, and the affective. Now, for the normal child, for the normal regular child. Now, I said that it's a big challenge in the educational space, especially mm. in the standard examination, WAEC and NECO and NAMTEP. Now, I have been an advocate for vocational training. During that conference in 2016, I presented a paper, and the paper questioned the norm. Why do we assess a child predominantly cognitively while that child learns in three different domains? But predominantly, we just assess the child in the cognitive domain, and that's it. Now, I can tell you for free that even the, 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 the regular child, the normal child, is being challenged. So I can say, for now, the educational curriculum is not favorable. I can say that for free. When it comes to WIEC, it's not that favorable to uh, children uh, with special needs especially with children with disabilities. Yes, they give, they try to, uh, the only thing that have been done that is a little bit encouraging is that the marking scheme is a little bit softer when uh, people are identified with special needs. But we are not pushing for this, uh, for the standard to be lowered for them. We are pushing that we should be able to create enough assessment, a, 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 a kind of an assessment that we take them into consideration. That is exactly the, the, the point we are making. So I, I made a paper in that conference, even in the National Educational Research Development Council 2020, uh, we had uh, uh, virtually anyway because of COVID. We also made it very clear that 
we should be able to design our curriculum to accommodate children, assessing children cognitively, affectively, and psychomotively equally because the children learn in this domain. Now, this has been the, 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 the challenge. So I could tell you for free now that as it stands now, the only green light the children with special needs we have is that Wayek Neko softening the marking scheme for them. But when it comes to the question, they have to attempt same questions, they have to be tested, same way though they have their own, uh, you know, uh, on paper, they have, you know, a means of testing them. But uh, why is the practicability in testing them? That is why I said earlier that handling these children, we should go hybrid. Because if we must test them, we must test them uniquely. We must test them in their own way. In WAEC, they are tested specially. And uh, if you are registering children in for WAEC now, you should specify, I have five children with special needs. You decide, you specify the special needs. They are not going to be in the same hall with the regular children, no. They are not going to be in the same hall with other children. They are going to have their own hall. So we should be able to let, we should be able to come to terms that these children, they have special needs. Yes, at some point, we should make them integrate. We should make them, we should harmonize them with other children. But uh, the, the, so much is still to be done in the curriculum. And that is why I want to, you know, salute so, uh, some schools that adopt a hybrid uh, kind of a blended curriculum that brings in the uh, British style, the American style that have gone so well uh, in terms of uh, catering for these children. But for the Nigerian curriculum, uh, so much still need to be done. And I'm believing that in the coming years, uh, this year we're having the National Education Research Development Council, which is uh, taking into consideration some of these things we are putting up. And we are still going to raise up the, the, uh, the banner and make sure that these children are giving their place in the curriculum cater for them. It's not just to bring them in. No, the curriculum should have a path for them. There should be a path, just like the British and the America uh, system have. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Victory. And it's very good to know that we have an advocate who is going to be on that platform. So we are hoping to hear very great news about the progress in that area. Um, we will take um, a couple of questions much. or comments. Um, I think Olalikon, yes, you could go ahead and speak. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. On the issue of um, WAEC, I want to say that we have been shortchanged in our country by WAEC. I will need to make some advocacy in that regard. Just across the West Coast, in West Coast, in Ghana, WAEC makes accommodations for special needs students. There are certain accommodations that are available for students in Ghana that are not available for us in Nigeria. For example, a student can give answers orally and have a scribe. It's accepted. They do it. But I wrote to a white registrar sometime last year about it. I never got the response. I don't know if um, the letter got to him, but we could begin to increase um, our demand for some, some of these services. I was earlier going to talk about um, secondary school students that at, the, um, at um, their level, they are more interested and cautious about their career path. And we need to, in all our support activities, to see that they achieve and um, sort of encourage them, focus on their areas of interest. But for the view of the Y, I hope a lot more people will take it up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Olalikon. And this is a very beautiful platform for us to um, push for that um, change to happen, right? And yes, yeah, it's, it's beautiful that you have done something in the past and many more will take it on from here uh, and go on to make those changes. And in, in, in good time, soon enough, I hope we'll be hearing um, of those changes happening. Um, there's a question also from Mary. 
and she talks about she she's asking about parents in denial they've noticed and observed certain things with a, a particular student um and have brought it up with the parents but the parents are in denial and say there's nothing wrong with their child how what do they do from there how do they go about handling that situation um emmanuel are you still on yes i am all right yes yeah. so can you start us off with answering that question please? that question please um well we also need to look at the side of the parents you know as a imagine you as a mom or as a dad your teacher if the teacher of your child is coming to tell you your child has this and that it's not really good news it's not palatable so if a parent is in denial it can be annoying for the teacher because the teacher knows that if the parent can come on board things can get better especially with early intervention so instead of looking at it that way as a professional, you, you might have to wear the parents' shoes and look for another approach. So like, I think, I don't know who mentioned it. I don't know if it was Norma or Madrisha, but someone talked about, um, okay, I think it was a man. He talked about um, when you want to meet parents, you should also come with um, plans that are going to work. So sometimes mm -hmm. you don't need to tell, if the parent is not coming at, um, coming on board at that moment you need to take some steps backwards and just come to symptoms like oh okay do you know what can we try this even if the parent does not want to go for an assessment i feel like if you present um if you present um, some strategic plans to the parents and it's working you can then be able to move the parents to your own side because now the parents can see um, results. So, for instance, there was a child that had difficulties reading, and he had um, he was in year two, and he couldn't even read the basic um, Queen Premier. So, um, the, the the parents kept saying that because they moved him from the east to they moved him from the east to Lagos. So, the parents kept insisting that he was so intelligent back in his old school. He was one of the best. So, she doesn't know what's going on. That she's not going to accept that report and stuff like that. So, um, in front of the parent there and then. The air teacher had called the child and had given him Queen Premier to read, and the parents could vividly see that the child was struggling. So she told the mom, I know your child's intelligent. I guess it has something to do with our curriculum and the way our school is doing things. So now let's try this. We're going to um, we're drawing this strategic plan, and this is what we're going to do for the next six to eight weeks. If the next time you give your child this kind of book to read and he's reading properly, would you at least listen to what we are trying to say? So um, the mom had agreed, although she still had some, you know, reservations. So between that six to eight weeks, the plan that was implemented actually started working. Because even in front of the child started gaining interest in reading, because sometimes the child even take the mom's phone, and although he pronounces it wrongly, he would still try his best to sound and blend and try to pronounce. And she saw how excited he was reading any book he picked up, even long words. But he was still trapped because it was like a game. It became so interesting because the blending part, they took him literally back to preschool. The way you teach preschool jolly phonics, that's exactly what they were doing with him. So he became so interested. He became so happy. And he was even doing it at home. And the mom actually came back to school and was like, you know what? I, I don't know if I was wrong or not, but let's try what you're saying. Let's do this for the end of the term. And if this and this, I can listen to the rest. And trust me, at the end of the day, the woman even paid for the um assessment with all happiness because she saw that there was progress so i'm not saying this style can work for every child there are so many examples i can give but it means that if you change your approach and you see things from the parents perspective and also have an action plan that the parents can actually see that it's working i feel every parent that wants the good of their child will come around and at the same time you need to explain to parents that you know it's normal that sometimes children struggle. You don't say it as a forever long thing. As, and then again, depending on the um, depending on the difficulty itself as well. But you need to come to the parents' angle. You need to see things from the parents' perspective. You need to think, okay, if I am this person, what how would I want to be spoken to? How would they, how would I want um how would I want to be addressed or how do I take this? Because some, some parents they are just in shock some of them enter their cars and go on google and check about and um, google what you just talked about and when they see all those really really big difficulties they become so scared and they start rejecting it i reject it in the name of jesus that's not my child and i feel like it's normal as in it's, it's very very scary 
as well. It even happens with medicine, you know, having a diagnosis from the doctor, it, it comes up very, very scary. So I feel like we should actually calm down and get to be part of the parents. Instead of being judgmental and looking at things like we're trying to help your child, there's no parent that wants their child to suffer. You just need to be able to move a bit, adjust yourself a bit. You know, that's where um, emotional intelligence comes in as well. Like, okay, how do I address this? How do I put it out? Cross, you know, you just, you know, as teachers, we are different things. You just have to find a way. Thank you. We thank you so up. much. Yeah, Martha. thank you. Yeah, Martha, thank you. go ahead. Yeah, I just said, as teachers, we can't give up, uh, even if parents mm. are in denial until they come around. We have to put in our best, talk to your colleagues. Somebody else can explain it better than you have been able to do it. So it's teamwork. Everybody has to be on board with it, but we can't give up. And the more uh, you communicate with the parents and show them the small the progresses step by step. Uh, they will come around because all parents really know their children. It's uh, it's just a matter of acceptance, which can take time. Some yeah. early intervention is the best, but uh, till parents you know are ready to accept it, uh, we have to give it our best and keep those communication open with the parents. Let them know the small steps you are doing and what they can do. And uh, sooner or later, they will come around. So and sometimes me. kids, sometimes kids, if it's not a very severe need, uh, they're not mature. And it's a bit of a eureka moment because suddenly they will like, oh, yeah, I can do this. So, you know, it's assimilated everything in the practice. And then it could be um, a, a eureka moment because they got it. And it was positive step and they can see if they put in the hard work uh, they will achieve so you know, just celebrate those things and keep the doors of communication with the parents open and, and um, just to buttress what yeah. um, Emanuela said yeah you, you 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 put yourself in the parents shoes sometimes and, and imagine how you would like you know how you would prefer to be told, you know, your child has a need. But I, I, as Mr. Victory said, you know, you have to let them know these are your concerns. For me, I use the words in all these meetings, observe, strategies, um, you know, uh, different, just to, I, I, I try to very, use a lot of euphemisms as much as possible to, so it doesn't sound as harsh as, because the, the, I think the, the great, a parent's greatest fear is that, you know, my child will not finish school and then there may not be any, anything in them life. So I always come from the perspective of like, look, there's an academic side to life and there's a social side to life. Like even most universities now, they don't just look at your academics, they look at what your extracurricular activities. In the IB, we have the CAS, your, you know, communities and societies and stuff like that. What do you do outside of school? How are you adding value to your community? Those little things help. What sports do you play? How, do, how, how are you as a human being generally, apart from your academics? So these are things that I try to you know, tell the parents, like, it's not just, yes, they may face this challenge. And like I said, parents always think like, okay, when we give them the support, their child will be cured of dyslexia or will be cured of dyscalculia. I'm like, no, this support we are giving is so that your child can have strategies to use by themselves eventually without the um, so much support from the same teacher or their teachers. So they know how to master math problems in future, how to, uh, you know, read. And, and there's so many ways to read it. Technology is making learning um, so much easier. But for parents, yeah, some, some will be in denial. And as Mr. Bridget said, if you show them that the, I've seen this challenge, I've observed this, this is what we want to do, this is what we hope to achieve. And when they see it happen, they will be, you know, more confident to be like, okay, let's take the next step to see. And something I always say, I'm like, yes, we, I want to support your child, but I want to support your child in the best way for your child. Because each educational psychologist report for every dyslexia student I've had, it is different. Yes, they diagnose dyslexia, but the strategies they employ, because they see the children at home, they see the children in school, and then they make their reports. The strategies they employ and the accommodations are always as per that particular child. So it's, it's a personalized way of learning for your child. That's the way I put it to them. So we don't want to just teach your child in the general way because it's not working for them. We need to know what are the things that excite your child? What are the things your child is interested in? What are the things that motivate your child to want to do better? What are the things your child needs less of or more of in so 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 and so lesson and stuff like that. So so if you I, I want to feel yeah there's some parents that will never accept and you know you go through the school year struggling and struggling. You go through years 
struggling. I've been with a parent that took about four years of struggle and struggle and struggle and struggle before she finally accepted that yes, her child had um, dyslexia. But when she did, then she realized that, oh, maybe, you know, it's a family thing because a lot of people in her family also have had similar challenges in the past, just that in our time of going to school, we didn't know what those things were and we just took it that you don't know how to read, but you don't know maths, but you don't know whatever. But as, as Manjusha said, we can't give up. You have to keep on, you know, showing them the evidence that we've, we've used this strategy. This is the little that has come out of it. You use this strategy. So please, can we just get an expert to tell us exactly what strategy to make sure your child can at least meet the, 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 the least, the smallest objective of this lesson or get at least the, the most minimal grade to pass at this lesson. Because on, unfortunately, the, the, these students may never ever get to be at the top of the class, the ones that struggle. Your gifted and talented students, sure, you, you, know, you motivate them, you push them enough, you challenge them enough, they can fly even higher. But the ones that are struggling may never be top of the class. But even though they are not going to be top of the class, they need to know that they are at a certain level and maintain that level and continue making um, progress. I so, sorry to digress a bit, but I follow this lady called Lisa Nichols, and um, she says she's a motivational speaker. Like she's amazing, and she said in secondary school her teacher told her because she couldn't read or spell or write, like she should never ever think of you know public speaking as a career. And then she's like, look at me now. So now whenever I see these reports and I see because even the educational psychologist reports can be very daunting, even for me, the teacher that has to tell the parents that this is what your child has, these are the limitations. So I'm always like, you know what, this is what the report says. This is what your child has. But there are strategies in place to make sure that they can do their best, even with these challenges. And that's our job as teachers, to make sure that your child becomes their best. In the, it may not be in the academics, but it may be in other areas. So I, I always promote like extracurricular activities, co-curricular activities, social interactions and stuff like that. Because I, I just believe like, yeah, even though they're not the top of the class now, they may never be the top of the class, but you just don't know what... Um, you know, the future may hold for them. Yeah. Yes, please. I just wanted to contribute. I just wanted to contribute. On the, um, for parents, when we talk to parents, we all just have to, like um, um, Otiba said, we all have to be patient with them. We need to understand where they are coming from. And because the society doesn't really tell good of special needs, it's really a tag there. They hear special needs, all of them are thinking autism. Your child has autism, your child has autism. That is it, it's finished for you. So when you're talking to parents, it's um, not the teacher's job alone to talk to a parent on matters that are this important. It should be the job of the sin, the heads, you know, coming together, having a meeting, understanding that they have their evidence, effective-based teaching. They've tried all that first and they all realize that, okay, we need to call the parents in. So when you're having the parents coming in for a conversation, you are giving smart approaches. You are giving them, this is what it is and this is how we're going to do it. But we need you at this point to come in because it's, it, it, it's, it's a two-way thing. The school, the house, everyone has to work together. Yes, there are some parents who don't even understand what you are saying based on their own exposure and their own environment. So we need to also understand these parents you are also speaking to. Who are they even exposed to? You understand? It may be hard for us, okay, I don't know them from home. How will I know what they are exposed to from home? From your first conversation and even their outburst, their first outburst, you then go back and do your research. I've had countless, countless experience with parents that will even want to insult the director and myself during our meetings, our initial meetings. And then we take it very calmly, then we sit down and we'll draw our map again. Okay, what did we do that the parent didn't understand? And we've presented the whole case to the parents. We now go back. In every meeting, daddy and mommy must be present. In most instances, daddies are the ones that are usually the one nothing is wrong with the child. It's sometimes mommy, but more most of the time is daddies. We now say, you know what, this time let's go through mommy. And then we are calling mommy, okay, mommy, thank you for coming for the last meeting. And then daddy made some points. We just need to find out. Daddy said his brother didn't talk to his nine and all that. You see what is happening now? Early intervention is key. Whenever we use that word early intervention, parents tend to come down to listen. When you start now, what we are doing is that we are reducing effects that will happen in the next five to six years. 
and then they are listening to us. So maybe if you could help us explain to daddy, and so the next meeting we are calling in, daddy will come in. And when daddy is coming in, we now will use, we're now going to the angle of, okay, early intervention, this is what we have in place, this, will, this is exactly what we need to do. We are showing them work. We are showing them their child's work. Because sometimes we have parents that are just first-time parents, and they are so busy at work, they don't even socialize with their children. They don't even understand what the certain age, for example, they have a two-year-old, they don't understand what other two years old are meant to achieve. So they are telling you their child is okay because when the child wants water, the child is crying for water. So they feel that is okay. He communicates, but he's, he's communicating based on crying and that is okay for them. So we need to now bring them back and now start teaching them okay, this is how we're going to do it. This is what we use in measuring. This is how we're going to show you. You know, you just have to go back to the basics with them calmly and gently. You know, my boss will always tell us that we also have to be very sympathetic with them. It doesn't mean that we also have to stop our intervention. We'll definitely continue providing that intervention intervention, and continue sending them, you know, sending them messages to understand that this is what we're doing on a weekly or monthly or termly basis with your children. Thank you, Salamatsu. Thank you, um, Unoma Princess, for answering um, that question really beautifully. And uh, thank you, Catherine, for keeping that conversation about WIEC going in the chat. Um, I think it's something we would all need to investigate even further, especially those of us that work um, in secondary um, areas. All right. So um, time is fast spent. I think we would ask, we'd have to ask Meadow Hall Foundation to do a part two of this so that we could jump right into scenarios and, and, and share the highlight of our stories with working with students with special needs. But I think I want us to wrap up with, um, with those stories, with those high points that we have experienced in our journey um, working with special needs. So just share one quick story or one, one quick story or one quick high that you have experienced or one quick um, share of a rewarding situation that you have experienced. I'm just going to start. Um, yeah, ahead, Marisha. For a for a child in our school who we monitored right from senior nursery, um, and you know the co continuous process of first getting the parents to accept their support, moving on with the interventions. He had a shadow teacher for a year, and his basic problem also was. Um, processing information. So that kind of covered comprehension, word problems, and things like that too. Today, uh, he gets uh, the best improved award uh, for literacy, which is like, you know, really um, fantastic for him. And uh, for us uh, teachers, it's a very feel good feeling that uh, all our efforts, um, and of course, his his contribution that he wanted to do his best and the parents coming on board uh, and supporting the school and supporting the child and doing that extra bit uh, for him and that today he uh, passed out from his school, uh, you know, being so confident that he can uh, work it out. I'm not saying that he will, uh, you know, he's uh, got it all, but he's got the strategies to work it out and to uh, be able to uh, comprehend or process the informa uh, information that he reads and be able to uh, come up with his own uh, answers uh, or be able to put things down on paper. The, the, his thoughts to paper, which was another uh, issue, he could probably explain things, but he, when it came down to writing, it was not the same, you know? So, but today he's uh, got the strategies, he's got, um, the know-how of how to cope with uh, his small shortcoming. And um, I would just hope uh, he does well. That was, I mean, that was a high point uh, for me because I've really seen this child since uh, senior nursery. And I, I, mean, I identify with bringing the problem to the parents, the denial, you know, everything that we've spoken to our last meeting where uh, the child has really, really, like in year six gets the most improved uh, for something which was his weakness uh, is now, uh, you know, he's mm -hmm. overcome that to a large extent. So well, that's, that's really great to hear. 
for me, I, I can I mean, there are a lot of moments. But in general, it's just them. There's a way a child looks when they finally get an idea. I've seen it on so many children's faces when they finally get an idea that they struggle with. For me, that's like priceless. So they struggle that drug and then they like, it's like the light bulb goes off. Like there's so many kids and then they, they, they seem like surprised at themselves that, you mean, I did that. I wrote uh, like a whole page, um, a one page, a four you know, line sheet um, paper, like I did that. And then I'm like, yeah. And, I'm, and then I say, did I help you? Did I help you? Did I do? And then I'm like, did I help you hold your pencil? Did I help you write? I'm like, no, I actually did it myself. And I'm like, so you see, for me, it's just that, um, yeah, there's one look they have. When they're like, oh, finally, now I get it. For me, that's like, my work is done. <laughs> Hi. So, yeah, um, those moments where you know you deserve some accolades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, for me, like, Uloma just said everything I wanted to see in my heart. Like, like, it's just that feeling, just, just that feeling, feeling your children. children. Making progress, you know, you know, then everyone is happy, happy. child has his confidence, has his confidence back, back. And, then and then you see, and, 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 and the teachers too are also happy with everything they've done. Yeah, it's just yeah. Moment a moment you are happy with yourself, and you're happy with the team, team, happy with the parents, the parents are happy with you, they appreciate their prayers, everybody's happy, everybody's happy. Yeah, it's a blessed feeling, it's a blessed feeling. Um, okay, so um, for me, I typically deal with um, behaviorals in children and um, a lot of um, kids that I have actually had to deal with would be like, you know, obviously the typical naughty um, behaviorals and all that. And some of them obviously affect the academic because they're always up to something and probably in some punishment and all of that. And one of the most rewarding experience i would say that i would never forget would be a child that um came from like he just had his mom um his dad wasn't really present and because of that the mom used to like lash out on him a lot and i think he just developed that and started lashing out even in school with teachers and he used to get into a lot of trouble so uh we had drawn an idp for him and we had been working with this I knew I could see changes, but the teacher couldn't because she was overwhelmed, even with other children in her class. So she wasn't even, even when I go like, oh, but he used to do this before, but now he does it. She's like, he still does it. Yes, I know he still does it, but not as much as he used to do, especially like interrupting the class, using his pencils to poke someone, um, having to stand up. And when someone is not um, in the same um, conversation with him or on his own opinion or idea he just like smack the person you know it was a lot and he was just young he was about seven so it was a lot and teacher would struggle so much so I remember one of the days I was having a very bad day in school and then he just came to my office and in my head I was just like oh my god what have you done mm -hmm. but obviously I I showed a different emotion to him I was like how are you how's everything and he said, I want to tell you something. I was like, what is it? I was like, do you know that today I did not get into any trouble? I promise you need to ask my teacher. I'm like, are you sure? I was like, I swear, I, you prom I promise I did not get into any um, um, problems. I'm like, okay, no problem. I would ask your teacher. And I hugged him, goodbye, blah, blah, blah. He left. And then the teacher was the next person. She came in my was like, she was like, do you know what? Guess what? I have a testimony. I kind of felt what she wanted to say, but I just allowed her to say it. It's like, do you know he didn't do he didn't I, he was just in class, he was listening, he finished his task, he wrote his um class work, he did everything. She was like, ah, that she didn't want to say anything because she noticed this is Monday, but she didn't want to jinx it because all the times that she had said in her mind that ah, thank God, the guy would just do the same thing again. So it was very, very nice. I felt so excited. And towards the end of the term, even the mom bought gifts for the teacher because everyone was so overwhelmed. And we even had to have a meeting with her that she needed to even change her own attitude, although we didn't put it this way anyway. And she had gotten better. And she said something to me. She said the other day, when she was um, um, upset about um, the um, help passing the remotes and she wasn't doing the time, that he came to her and said, Mommy, take a deep breath. Do you, are you thirsty? Do you need some water? And she was just looking at him like, what is going on here? He said, relax. Sometimes it's not as difficult as you think it is. And in her mind, she was just like, huh? Okay. She was really 
really, she was really, 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 really excited and so happy. And it, it just really made me feel good. I know I've had a lot of successes, but this particular success was so good for me and I would never stop talking about it. Thanks for sharing that with us as well. Um, uh, Mr. Olalekon had a very quick share. You want to do that very quickly before we bring this to a close? Um, there's this one that I keep remembering. It's happened a lot of, a number of years back. I think about 20 years now, but I can't forget it. There's this child that paints or draws all this artwork, you will use black. Black crayon, black paint. Ask him to draw a chair, he will do it in black. A candle, black. The peak of it was around Christmas. He had to draw, um, they were drawing um, angels and all of that. And you know, guess what color he used for the angel? Black. So I, I was calling and we, we wonder what could have happened. And you know, in our society, people will begin to think all kinds of things about this child and say, what kind of a child does this? A black angel, black candle. But I sat with the child and we went through his drawing books, talk about, began to talk about um, his pictures. I let him talk, his drawings. We asked him questions about it. What does he draw? Why? Um, okay, what is this story I'm seeing? And he will explain. Then he got to the building. He was asked to draw his house. And I said, oh, this is your house? He said, yes. He said, but you live just across the school, a few blocks away, and you live in a bungalow. What you have drawn is a story building. The child said, well, that bungalow is not my house. This is my house. The house he drew and painted black, including windows and doors. And I said, what? Are you sure? I didn't know about that. I thought your house is a bungalow. He said, oh, we just moved in there like three months ago. My house got burnt. You know, wow. that just showed you what had registered on the child, in the child's mind. And the teachers were already wondering and already thinking all kinds of things, you know, especially some who are religious. But on talking with the child, we got to know that the, the, build, the house was burnt and he had that picture in his mind, the blackness. That's what he keeps reproducing. All of his drawings, chairs, tables, everything has to be black. Trauma. And this would not have been um, identified if not for probing questions and some patience. So maybe we can use that as um, a learning point for some of our dealings with young ones. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Olalikon. Um, we would have a final word from Mr. Victory, if it's still on. Um, just so you know, um, there's a link that has been shared with you in the chat. Please, it's very important that we get your feedback and also um, look forward to a possibility of continuing this conversation um, in the near future. So please, um, there's a link, click on the link and, and fill out that form. And it's also an avenue to have further contact um, relating to this and many other opportunities uh, that would help you as a teacher in your practice. So please, the link has already been shared. Just click on it and, and go ahead to fill it. In. Mr. Victor, are you, Mr. Victory, sorry, are you ready to give us your final comments and a wild um, moment yes. for Thank you very much, uh, okay, Madrita. Go ahead. It's been a, it's been a very wonderful section. Um, I have, uh, I want to say and suggest and appeal to Medu Hall, uh, the organizers of this, uh, that we seeing the need of um, the the special needs children. And, and you know, so much still need to be done. I personally am recommending that every teacher, whether you are teaching regular classroom or not, needs to have a sound understanding of you know mental health and uh, have to have an understanding of this. So, amongst other things, I recommend that 
the organizers see a way of organizing the kind of virtual training where schools should be, you know, at least let's let's get to train our teachers on identifying these children with special needs and how we can at least provide some pilates at the you know uh, early stage. Uh, it's when it gets to critical levels, then we will get to include them and get to get experts in. Then number two, I also want to lend my voice to what other some persons have said as regarding the issue of external examinations in Nigeria. The organizers of this uh, meeting could also uh, use their good office to, you know, write and meet and uh, mitigate with, you know, examining bodies, uh, you know, policymakers. Come during our uh, conferences, curriculum conference, because everything we do, you should understand that everything that goes on during examinations fall back to the curriculum. The curriculum is like the constitution. And so if you must correct anything, you must come and correct the curriculum. Come on during our curriculum conferences and make some propositions, some presentations. I'm sure it will go a long way to really help uh, everybody. So I really want to appreciate everybody for this uh, time. And I believe that Thank with you. this foundation being laid, we are going somewhere. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Victory. Just a quick one before you sign out. I know you have to leave for another meeting. What date is your curriculum um, conference? If you, would, if you would share that with us. Um, I will confirm the exact date for this uh, year summit, but it's some, okay. sometime around uh, September. I'll confirm the date and uh, I'll get back to you okay. if you want. Okay, we, we would we would really love to have that so we can we can follow up with that. Um, sure. Thank you so so very much. Um, thank you, panelists. Thank you, Noma Salamatu, Emanuela. Manjusha and Mr. Victory, thank you very much to all of you who participated fully. Um, some of you were kicked out at different times, but you still uh, persevered like the teachers that you are and, and kept knocking on the door. So thank you for staying through. Please for, uh, don't forget to uh, fill in the feedback form with the link. Uh, Mr. Chibuzo, please could you um, send in that? to the chat once again so that people have it right at the tip of their fingers. Just before we go on, um, many years ago, I, I got my first exposure into special education need as a typical classroom teacher, right? And I agree with what Noma and Mr. Victory said. Every teacher should be exposed to special education needs because when you are able to meet the special education learners, you are able to meet everybody at the end of the day. And I'm gonna share just something very quick um, that I learned from that first interaction. Um, calling anyone, everyone, what in the world is wrong with me? I know how it feels, but cannot explain it. I don't see what others see, nor hear what is said. I see and call words on paper, but you say those words are not here. When I dare ask the difference between saw and was, for I don't know, you ask me, can't you see? But I can't. I wonder, sometimes I wonder if I even have a mind. Most times I choke on my thoughts and say, never mind. This refrain I fear is how I see my mind. Never mind, one that never works. Is it really me or the way you make me feel? Yes, I hear it all. You say I have a leaky memory. I go on mind trips and know no friends. While I may not talk, I communicate. I run away from you for a reason. I avoid your stare for you to reach my call and echo you for your understanding. But I know it, I feel it. There's that light in me. You see in my peers, come find it and I'll let you in from your world into mine. For where you think I lack, I bountifully present. And this was a beautiful poem by Mr. Aderinto, who I first got interaction with that whole special needs and took me on my special needs journey. So thank you, thank you, thank you very much, everyone. With this, we will bring our webinar for today to a close. And I want to say many thanks to Ms. Norma, Ms. Manuela, Ms. Manjusha, Salamat, Ms. Salamat, Mr. Victory. Thank you for your time. And thank you for being patient, even though we overshot our expected time. So see you all um, at the next edition of the webinar and have a good day.